afternoon. Oh, yes. Well, in the name of Jesus, I greet you all. Amen. It is a privilege for me to be here this morning, and I want to thank God for the opportunity. And uh, I want to greet my son as well. He's seated in front here. In fact, he insisted that I should preach today's sermon to him, and I refused. So he is sitting there with interest. And, uh, yeah, may God bless your son. Pastor, my colleague, thank you very much, for, uh, our pastor, for being here with us, uh, the elders and all members of the church, and Happy New Year. Am I right? Yes, Happy New Year. We want to thank God, you know, for having brought us here, and uh, I, it is by his mercies that we are here. You know, I want to preach, but before I do so, I've got two sermons. One is a very short sermon, and the other is the sermon that I want to preach today. Therefore... Let me do this. Let us turn John 3, verse 17. John 3, verse 17. In fact, maybe we should start at verse 16. Verse 16. For God so loveth the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. The world refers to you and me. So I need to say this morning, the Son was not sent into the world to condemn us. So God did not die so that we can go to hell. But the Bible says here, but that the world through him might be saved. I want to say to someone here who has never accepted Christ as a personal savior, this is your moment. God died for you. He died so that you might be saved. Now I want to say, even if you may be the only sinner seated here today, God loves you so much that he does not want you to perish. Let us look at another in the book of 2 Peter 3, verse, a few verses there. 2 Peter verse 3. No, no, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3. Are we there? Yes. 
Then he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count it slackness, but is long suffering to us, towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. May I suggest this afternoon that one thing that has held the Lord from coming, it's me. And it's you. So the Lord has delayed his coming so that you and me can repent. As soon as we have obliged to his love and his purpose for us to be saved, Jesus will come. He will come again. So, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall mend with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be bent. And you know, beloved, we look forward to a world that God has prepared for us. You know, John talking about this world, says, he, he says something that is beautiful. In John, in, in Revelation chapter uh, 21, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Then he continues to say, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. How wonderful is this? And God shall wipe away all tears. We will not engage as to whether we should switch the machine on on or off. You know, he, the tears will be, he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying, neither that there shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And I love this one. I love verse 5. Verse 5, I love it. And he that sat upon the throne, he, who is he that sat upon the throne? It is God himself. This is what God said. Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, he said, not unto John, he said unto me, for these words are true and faithful. It will happen, whether you like it or not, Jesus will come again. And everything that is troubling us will come to an end. But you know, it will not come to an end until you and me give our lives to Jesus Christ. You know, we're talking about small things that we are sick. There's no job, you know, and we are hungry and all. These are just small things. God, on, on, in, 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 in the agenda of God, the main thing for him to achieve is for everyone who is in here to be saved. To be saved. But the sad part is that he will come like a thief. So in other words, there is no timetable for the coming of the Lord. Jesus requires us all here to be ready for his coming. I want to say to someone here, if you have never accepted Jesus as your personal savior, I want to call upon you. If maybe you accepted Christ as your personal savior and something happened, and you lost faith and hope, and today you've just come here because it is the first Sabbath of the year, I want to say, you are. this is your moment. It is God who brought you here. Accept Christ as your personal savior and serve him. Live for him. He is coming again. And all what we see here, the confusion that we see, will come to an end. Will you accept Jesus? Will you give your heart to him? You know, someone said, Paul was preaching. And he said to Paul, you shouldn't have said these words because I'm almost persuaded. Never use the word almost. I was almost persuaded. 
You know, I, I, I almost made a decision for Jesus, but something held me up. It is the devil's glue that is holding you up. Accept Christ as your personal savior. Let us close our eyes as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the privilege of prayer. There's someone here. You brought that person here. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, you may do that which you are best at doing. Come and save us from our sins. May our names be written in the book of life. When you come again, Heavenly Father, may we have a privilege of seeing you and being with you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Now I am going to preach the sermon for today. Brother, Brother Bongani, where are you? Where is Bongani? Uh, my brother, 533, the first and the last stanza. 533, the first and the last stanza. And whilst we are doing that, we then turn our Bibles to the book of Exodus. I'm going to be very short. In the book of Exodus chapter 14, please. Exodus chapter 14. To of oh, all will not be the press by many force that will not break at will Stands up. Lord, give me and the faith of and then may Lord may come. I'll taste your home, the hallowed news, the hallowed news of home, the home of home. It was last week on Sabbath, and I was seated somewhere there when a phone was ringing. And my wife gave me the, the phone, and he said, please, will you respond to this? As I quietly walked out, and I was, you know, on my phone, and the voice was saying, your daughter is not well. She is sick. And immediately, I called my wife, and I said, Jose was not well. And my wife quietly went out and took the phone, and I came back said quietly, and uh, I think whatever conversation that went then, uh, after some few minutes, and she came, she said, please, let's go home. We went home. It was prayer time. We were supposed to pray for my daughter. She was not well. So, she was, I think they took her to the doctor, and uh, after, I think, three or four hours, went back home, or to the camp, she was at the campsite, went to the campsite. But I think it was again, after four or five hours, when another call came. And this time, we're told, your daughter again is not well. Please call an ambulance. When a person says you must call an ambulance, then you know that there is trouble. You know, my wife quickly, and I think... She, it was called, and she was rushed to the hospital. I then said to my wife, you know what? My daughter is in Bloemfontein. We are here. I'm not going to sit here. You know, I just want to be by my daughter. She was admitted that evening, by the way. So we agreed with my wife. I think I left very late in the evening. In fact, as I was driving, reversing the car, just as I was you know, beyond the driveway, and my wife said, just a minute. Will you come? And I drove in, and she said, I want to talk to you. And I said, what's, what's, what's the problem now? I mean, please, I have to be with our daughter. And she said, Daddy, you're not going anywhere. I am going, and you will remain home. Why? My father and my mother are here. You take care of them, and I will take care of our daughter. But you know what had happened is that, again, on Friday, this is what I did not tell you. 
on Friday at about 6 o'clock, my wife had an asthma attack. On Sabbath evening, she wants to go and fetch the daughter about 400 kilometers. I mean, you are definitely exposing her to unnecessary risk, if I was to say yes. But you see, I have a problem also. I have a problem, my eyes, you know, in, uh, 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 during the night, I can't see it, see clearly. Now, her argument was, if I lose my daughter, I don't want to lose you too. So please, allow me, let's rather have me take the risk rather than you. But we had to settle it, and uh, so I had my eldest son there, Ria, and she said, okay, fine. Uh, you can only drive if Ria is going with you. Ria was supposed to go to work on Sunday. I said, but she's supposed to go. I said, no. And then I said, okay, fine. Let's settle for it. I'll go with her. So I drove to Bloemfontein. I arrived there in the early hours of the morning. And uh, I had to sleep at hospital that, that night, you know, uh, just beside my, uh, there was a bed uh, next to my daughter's bed. And uh, the following morning, doctor comes and she's, the doctor says to me, okay, fine. Uh, I am going to release your daughter. And I'm excited, Right. So all the documents are brought, and uh, I sign the release, the discharge forms. And lo and behold, just two minutes after I signed those documents, the asthma attack again is back. My daughter is coughing, and the cough is not stopping. And I know if I take her home, I'll be again calling for trouble. So doctor is called by the nurse, and doctor says, sorry, tell him that girl is not going anywhere. So I had to spend some few days. On Wednesday, she was released, and I come with her. We come home, and as we arrived home, after two hours, there's another attack. And we send her to Sunning Hill, and the doctor says, she's not going anywhere. So this last week, I spent five days at hospital. You know, this is how I started 2019. I started 2019 at a hospital. But you know, three weeks ago, mom also was not okay. My mom is about 85, will be 85 on the 23rd, 33rd of, of February. But you know, the condition of mom, sometimes I look at her and I cry. Because you know, mom can't even recognize that I'm his son. We took mom to a hospital in Mafiking. Unfortunately, they did not turn it. She developed some bad sores. They were so terrible that mom was completely paralyzed. So mom can talk. Mom can feed herself. Mom has to be carried from a bed to a chair back and has to be fed. And this has been my mom's life for the last five years. Oh, well, there's something that I want to tell you. God is good. Do you understand what I'm talking about? God is good. I have tasted the goodness of the Lord. Uh, 2013, I just lost a job for no reason. I still don't understand why. I was a CEO of an, a company in government. And all of a sudden, we had to part ways. Government and, you know. And for the, for the next four years, I tried to get a job, and I did not get a job. And here is something that is painful. Those who are your friends will distance themselves from you. You will be alone. You will not get help. And you have applied for, you know, for a number of jobs throughout and nobody responds and all of a sudden on this particular day you wake up and uh, you check your emails three or four of them are saying regret You're not gonna get any job why should did they talk to each other because i did not even inform them <laughs> and you know you have to cry you have to cry because you don't have any solution to this and uh, yeah i have gone through we have gone with my family. We have seen it all. But you know, during that time, God has been with us. Now, let me tell you. I went to Monash, and I was going to register. My son wanted to go there, but 
Then I decided to register, you know, and do a master's. And little did I know that God had led me to that institution. I only had 20,000. The fees that were needed was 95,000. I'm going to tell you something. Three years I studied, no demand for those fees. As soon as I wrote my last exam, a call came and they said, when are you paying us? <laughs> you know, when I had been told that I had passed, I said, when are you paying us? I said, okay, God works in, and then I said, I need this, this certificate because now I'm looking, I'm going to use it, you know, maybe I'll leverage on it, I can get a job, no, maybe I'll get a job somewhere. And you know what happens? Then they, I, I, I'm not going to get that certificate. I, I'm, I'm owing the university. They will not give me. I am just crazy. I should not even think about that. You know? And so, but there was some money that was supposed to come. And so with my wife, we worked around the budget, did the budget, and the, it became clear that all we could afford was to at least offset 20,000 of the fees that I was outstanding. All right? Now, but I'll still not get my certificate. It's clear that I'm not, I'm not getting any certificate. And on the day that the money was deposited into my bank account, exactly the balance of the university was in that bank account. I have seen it all. I always tell my wife, you don't have to worry. God will take care of it. God will take care of it. Someone just calls and he says, yes, and how are you? Then he says, yeah. But let me just give you some few thousands here. And you are thankful. That person has been sent by God. And you go home. The moment you go home, someone is sick. And the cost of the medicine and the doctor to take care of that person is that 5,000 that we're given. God is always ahead of me. And he's ahead of those who are facing troubles and, you know, and who don't. Let me just tell you. Let's just read about the power of God. But before I do that, listen to what uh, Patras and Prophets, chapter 25, the last sentence says. It says, the path where God leads the way may lie through the desert or the sea, but it's always safe path. It's a safe path. That's what it says. Oh, let me read it again. Maybe I did not read it there. Maybe there's a problem. Please, my elder, come. Uh, you know I have a problem of ice, my elder. Please help me here. Can you please read this one? Please, elder. This, this last sentence, please. Help. The one just next to the, yeah. the path. The no, 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 no. This last sentence. The path. Yeah, the path, yes. The path where God leads the way may lie through the desert or the sea, but it is a safe path. Ah. It may lie where? Through the what? The desert and the what? And the sea. But it is a what? God is crazy. I'm, and I'm going to prove to you God is crazy. Let's just read something. Let's go to chapter 14. Chapter 14, uh, the book of Revelation. Yeah, no, the book of Exodus. Chapter 14, Exodus. God is just crazy. But I love him nevertheless. Eh? Listen to what? He says, <laughs> Wow. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Uh, 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 uh. Is there another translation? For God, for Pharaoh will say, who will say this is Pharaoh? What? To whom will he say? The children of who? Of Israel. Who are the, we are the children of what? Of Israel. Now this is what Pharaoh is saying of us. He says that they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has done what? Shut them out. Okay? Shut them in. Shut them in. When you are shut in, there is no way out. Do you know that? There is no way out. I mean, you can use your academic certificates and everything. You're not going to have any solution. Forget it. Just sit there and be frustrated and suffer a little bit of, you know, anxiety and all that. All right? Now, that's what Pharaoh was saying, that this was going to happen. And by the way, uh, both in front of them was the sea. One side, a mountain. And on the other side, it was a mountain. And where they were coming from, Pharaoh was coming. Right? You can't go to the mountain. Both sides is, you know, and you can't, you know, to the sea. And by the way, who planted this? Who planted this? It is God. So God puts the children of Israel into a situation where they will find it very difficult to find a solution to their problem. All right? He does that. 
In fact, when you read the verses just before this one, they were going the right direction. And all of a sudden, God commands, comes to Moses and says, change direction. Go to a wrong direction. In human language, they were going the wrong direction. All right? Now, was Moses crazy? I don't even understand Moses' leadership. He takes them to, to the sea. What are they going to do to the sea? And Pharaoh is coming, all right? Now, Pharaoh is excited. He says, yeah, now these people have put them into trouble. But let's read verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew might, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so, what? Afraid. They were what? Afraid. I want to ask you a question. Have you been afraid? Has something happened in your life that you are so afraid and you don't know what to do? The children of Israel were paralyzed with fear. And the Egyptians were coming. At the command of who? Of God. God had commanded the Egyptians to pursue them. And he leads them into the sea. All right? But what does Moses say? Moses says to them, verse 13, and Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians you see, you will see them no more. Ah, verse 14 is a very nice one. It says, the Lord will do what? What will the Lord do? Fight. He will fight for whom? For you. Right? The Lord will fight for you. And ye shall hold your peace. The Lord will fight for you. May I say to you today, if you are in that situation and you don't know what to do, just give it all to the Lord. Give it all to the Lord. He knows what to do. You know, there are situations that we create ourselves. God does not create those situations. But because he's a loving God who does not want anyone to perish, if you go to him, he will try and help you to get out of that situation. And the second situation is the one that is created by God himself. You know? You are suffering from cancer and you don't know. By the way, God had said, I am going to create this situation, you know, so that I can be glorified. I am going to use you and put you into a trouble so I can be glorified. In fact, I want to show off my power. You know, they went into the sea and God parted the sea and they went to the other side and all the Egyptians were what? Were destroyed. Now listen to the last story. I'm going to tell you another story, almost similar to this one. All right? Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. It's a, it's a story similar to that one. Let's have a look at this one. Because, you know, I want to see if God is consistent. All right? If God is consistent. Maybe this is just a story that was just written, you know, just to fool us. Yeah. Verse 23. Let's look at verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. In fact, he had said to them, yet in other, you know, the, the, they'd say, let us cross over to the other side. And they just followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm, in so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Who was asleep? Jesus was asleep. Now, think of it. Jesus says to them, let us cross over to the other side. All right? He is the one who's putting them in that condition. And by the way, it was late. And the Sea of Galilee was known to be a very dangerous sea during that time. When Jesus, he told them, let us cross over to the other side. He tells them to cross over at an awkward time. In fact, these people were the scientists in as far as the sea is concerned that they would have been reluctant to go there during that time. But at the command of Jesus, they get into the sea and they cross to the other side. And he goes at the stern, bottom of the, you know, of the boat, and he goes to sleep. And you know what happens? Immediately, there's a great storm. There's a great storm. And what happened at that storm? They use all their skills to try and maneuver, you know, the boat into safety. And it does not work. In fact, I, I, when I was thinking about this sermon, I was saying to myself, the sea was excited because the king of kings, was in the midst of the sea and sleeping had used the sea as his bed. So the sea was just excited. You understand? And they thought, now 
It is foolish for these guys just to think in the sea can destroy its own maker. It is just, it is just unthinkable. So Jesus, as a human being, was just, you know, he was sleepy. And the father was taking care of, of the business. And all of a sudden, they wake up and they say, eh, eh, Care us not that we perish. And he wakes up and then he says to them, he starts by coming, they say, Please, uh, peace be still. And the sea behaves. And Jesus directs a very pertinent question as I move towards those of my sermon. He says to them, Where is your faith. I just want to tell you, the someone is not in what happened in the sea. The someone is there. The question that Jesus directed to them, where is your faith? In fact, when you read in Genesis, they were afraid. They are afraid again. Did you read that? The disciples are what? Are afraid. In fact, the disciples were the followers of Jesus. So is this the church. We are the church. We are the disciples. In the midst of that sea, we are afraid. And Jesus comes to us. And then he says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Then he says, what, what question does he ask them? Where is your faith? Now, tell me, why is faith so important in this sermon? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Faith is the one that set you apart from the rest of the people. You know, when God displays his trophies and he is excited, he says, here are they that keep two things. They keep the commandment of what? Of Jesus Christ. And the faith of whom? Not fake faith. I, Chinese faith. It is the faith of whom? Of Jesus Christ. Now, this faith of Jesus Christ is the one that will keep us safe through the storm. Now, I want to say to you, when we enter into 20, uh, 2019, maybe you are having a problem and there is no solution to that problem. I cannot help you. and No one here can help you. Could be that it's a terrible divorce. And let me tell you, you're not going to stop it. We may try, Pastor Wall. I'm not saying don't go to Pastor Wall. You know, we need to go to Pastor Wall, right? We go to him, but you are, you, you are trying, but th there is no solution to this. God is saying, you see the Egyptians? Those Egyptians, you will not see them anymore. It, maybe it's cancer that is eating you up, and you are fearful. Maybe you have been looking for a job for a long time. Yesterday I was talking to someone who was saying to me, I have a job but I'm required to work on the Sabbath and please, I, I, I'm tired of being a beggar. So I'm going to work on the Sabbath. I want to say to you, be strong. Trust in the Lord. He can do better than that job. He can do better than that job. I wish to challenge you this morning. Trust in the Lord. The Lord knows the beginning to the end. And I can assure you, if you have accepted and you love the Lord as your personal Savior, allow him to sleep. Don't wake him up. Don't wake him up because the sea has no authority to kill its master. The sea was just excited. You get what I'm saying? Where, are, where, where, where we stay, there are beds that are very early in the morning at 5 o'clock, I mean, they will just sing. and uh, uh, I, You know, I just sometimes just wish to wake up, go outside and curse them. <laughs> so that they don't come again. Because every morning they are there. But, you know, I cannot do that because they are praising God. And recently I have learned something in the morning that the choir is increasing. Because when those birds started... It was only them. And then now there are other tunes, other smaller beds they know where to meet, you know, for that chorus and choir. And I've said, oh, please, Lord, thank you for bringing the church to my house so that we can, I can praise you. May God bless you. Face 2019 with courage. I give you Jesus.